Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much to, for joining us today for Earth Echoes STEM Explore Virtual Career Connection featuring Dr. Carlissa Callwood from the Perry Institute for Marine Science. We're so excited to have you all here with us today. My name is Casey and I'm a programs manager here at Earth Echo and I'm going to help co-host and moderate today's live event. Now before we get started, I do want to have a little bit of a disclaimer. There are a lot of people using the internet these days. A lot of people are online. In fact, we have a lot of people joining us right now. We're so excited to have you. On YouTube, we do have a chat feature. On Zoom, we have a Q&A feature. And if we do experience any technical difficulties, please be patient and we will resume our presentation as quickly as possible. So with that said, here at Earth Echo International, we are a global nonprofit founded on the belief that youth have the power to change the planet. Reaching more than 2 million people in 146 countries, we provide original content, immersive experiences, and trusted resources to empower young people to become leaders and problem solvers in their community as well as around the world. Now today, I'm really excited to have one of our exceptional youth leaders joining us. Her name is Maria, and she's going to help me moderate today's live event. So Maria Fernanda Torres just graduated from MAST at FIU Biscayne Bay Campus in Florida. Outside of school, she's a Miami Waterkeeper Ambassador and shares information on South Florida's water crisis with diverse audiences through presentations and cleanup events. Maria will be attending Boston University soon and is looking forward to studying marine biology while continuing her path to medical school. So Maria, we're so excited to have you moderate today's event with Dr. Callwood. Take it away. Thanks, Casey. Uh, we're so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us as we learn about the exciting and sustainable careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, the, the live event is part of the STEM Explore Earth Echoes program that brings inspiration to life by telling the stories of dynamic female professionals in STEM careers during live virtual career connections. We also want to thank our founding sponsor, Raytheon Technologies, for their support of women in STEM. And just as a reminder that you can send in questions anytime via chat, and we will break through throughout today's presentation to answer your questions. So feel free to start typing questions in the chat space. We'll be sure to answer those as we go along. Okay, so now let's get started. Today, we welcome Dr. Carlissa Colwood, Director of Community Conservation Action Program at Perry Institute for Marine Science. Welcome, Dr. Carlwood. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Carlissa Carlwood is a marine scientist and educator who focuses on interdisciplinary approaches to evaluating fisheries and conservation management. Her interests include establishing practices to enhance science education, particularly those from those undeserved communities and enhancing strategies to better bridge the gaps that exist between scientists, policymakers, and the public through informal science learning and interdisciplinary approaches. So Dr. Colwood, why don't you tell us a little bit more about your work? Sure, um, so I describe myself as an interdisciplinary marine scientist and interdisciplinary means combining two or more fields. So I combine multiple specialty areas in order to be successful at my job. So I am a marine ecologist who studies how marine organisms relate to or other organisms and the environment. I use social science to help gain a better understanding of the role that people play in the marine environment. I wanna know things like what do people do and why and what do they think is going on in the environment and ways that they can help. I also work as an informal science educator. So I teach science to people outside of traditional school settings. That could be in museums, aquariums, parks, or even outdoors or on the water. And I also work in science communication. And that's figuring out the best ways to talk to people about science, but also training other people who work in the sciences to be able to do the same with everyone and anyone, regardless of their background, experience, education, level, or age. As an interdisciplinary marine scientist, I study fisheries science. And when we talk about fisheries, that's a system where you take and remove fish, 
um, from their habitat. And oftentimes, or most times in a fishery, there are people involved. So it's a very interdisciplinary system. In particular, I focus on fisheries management, conservation, and sustainability. Management refers to ensuring regulations, policies, and other protections are in place to help reduce negative impacts to the environment or the organism. Conservation, on the other hand, looks at protecting a resource to prevent wasting it or potentially losing it completely, like to extinction. And sustainability refers to ensuring that a resource is preserved and available for use and enjoyment by future generations. We want to ensure that 20 years from now, 100 years from now, or even 1,000 years from now, people can still benefit from all of the things the ocean provides to us now. Currently, I work at the Perry Institute for Marine Science, and we are a program-based institution conducting research throughout the Bahamas and other parts of the Caribbean. Perry Institute supports a wide range of research that is helping to protect our oceans. The research we conduct is focused on management of fisheries, improving the condition of corals, conservation and restoration of coastal ecosystems, and conservation of threatened marine species. We use the information that we gather from our research in different programs in order to promote stewardship of our oceans. These programs focus on enhancing awareness of the condition of our oceans, working closely with governments to develop management strategies, and also educating the next generation of marine scientists, which is a big part of my role as the director of the, the Community Conservation Education and Action Program, which is a very long title. Um, so this is a brand new program that I am building from scratch. And the goal of this program is to empower Perry Institute to be better at working with our local partners in order to promote conservation through enhanced community engagement. We want to continue to increase awareness of all of the issues impacting coral reefs and other resources in the marine environment, but also to promote behavior and changes, behavior changes and actions that local communities from the kids all the way up to the adults can take to help support conservation efforts. We also want to build capacity locally so that people doing research and conservation in the Bahamas are Bahamians. As part of this program, I'll also be doing some social science work in partnership with Perry's other research programs and teams to better understand the communities we work in and those key stakeholders like fishers and consumers. We want to ensure that we know what those people know um, and why they do the things that they do so we can collaboratively work with them and to share why conservation is important and to encourage the actions that they can also take to contribute to this. Um, this job is my dream job. I feel like I've been working my entire career to get to this point because it's the perfect combination of all of the things that I'm super passionate about. Passionate about. Wow, that's fantastic work, Dr. Colwood. So can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? So let's start with where you currently live and where you grew up. Sure. So I currently live in the Bahamas on the island of New Providence in Nassau. Um, and you can see that I did a close up picture so that you can see the islands there. Um, and this is where my current work with the Perry Institute is based, but I'm originally from the Virgin Islands down here. So I grew up between the islands of St. Thomas, part of the US Virgin Islands where I lived with my grandmother and Tortola, part of the British Virgin Islands where the rest of my family lived. I spent a lot of time traveling between these two islands via boats and spending time on the beach with my cousins and my family. And this is really where my love of the ocean was developed. Here's a picture of um, baby Carlisa right after um, playing on the beach and getting out of the ocean. And I love this picture. Um, because my parents told me that I learned how to swim before I could walk because all I wanted to do was be in the water all the time. It didn't matter what time of day it was, that's what I wanted to do was go inside and jump in the ocean. Um, but um, my mother had me when she was still in high school, she was really young. So when she had the opportunity to go to college, I stayed behind in the Virgin Islands and lived with my grandmother 
until my mom finished college. And then I moved up to Miami um, where I lived with her and my stepdad. And that was around middle school age. And I stayed in Miami through high school and college and for most of my career um, for about 20 years. Um, and then on a whim, four years ago, I decided to move diagonally way across the United States to live in Washington state. Wow, that's amazing. I live in Florida, so the ocean is pretty near me too. So Dr. Callwood, what was your educational pathway to your career? So getting to where I am now required a lot of trial and error because while I knew what I wanted to do, I knew I wanted to do something involving the ocean. I had no idea what that was and I quickly learned that there were lots of options. So being that I lived in Miami, um, I went to the University of Miami for undergrad. Honestly, I only applied to two schools. I applied to University of Miami and um, a university in Hawaii because those were my two, those were the two that I wanted to go to. I ended up getting into Miami and got a scholarship and I got my bachelor's in marine science and biology. And about five years after that, I eventually went back to get my master's and then my PhD in marine affairs and ecosystem science and policy. A lot of my experience in marine science actually came from experiences I was able to have during school. My very first job, I was a lab assistant for a professor studying how to prevent invasive species that get transported by ballast water. Ballast water is the water that's taken up by a ship to help stabilize it during a voyage. The problem is that when that ship takes on water, it also picks up all the organisms that live in the water in that area. And when it gets to its final destination, it releases those organisms in a completely different area where they're, they're not from. Um, and that can cause a lot of problems. So we wanted to see what ways could be used to remove those organisms from the water before they got released into a new environment. So we tested lots of different things like using filters, using caffeine, flashing them with UV lights, things like that to see what would prevent um, the spread of these organisms. Now, while that research was really cool and we got to do some awesome things, I spent a lot of my time mixing up chemicals and making dilutions, which is when you add water to make those chemicals weaker. Um, and the rest of my time washing glassware multiple times a day. Now, I don't know about any of you, but the one chore that I absolutely hate is washing dishes. So I knew I didn't wanna do that for a job. So I decided that I wanted nothing to do with having to wash and disinfect glassware or making dilutions because it was so monotonous and it just wasn't fun for me. So after that, that summer, I got an internship studying oyster larvae, which are um, oyster babies. We wanted to see if the larvae would cross haloclines, which are boundaries of water with different salinity levels. So if you think about fresh water sitting on top of salt water, in the middle of that is a boundary where they're mixing, right? But it's still keeping the two types separate. So we wanted to see if the larvae, um, if they were on the bottom, would they cross the boundary to end up at the top? So I would go out and collect the larvae from the ocean or from um, other research institutions. I would spend my days mixing up different batches of water with different amount of salt. And then I would place the water and the larvae in a large container and I would have to be really careful about layering those different types of water so that they didn't mix fully. And after a certain amount of time, I would take a little eyedropper and remove the water from the top to see if there was any larvae there. Because if there was, that meant that they were actively crossing between those layers. And I would put that water under a microscope and count all of the larvae that I saw. So after that internship, I decided that I wanted to do nothing with using microscopes every day because I went home with a headache. I felt like I was cross-eyed all the time and they were just too small to deal with. So this was something that was not for me. So I moved on to the next thing. So next I did, you can go back one slide. Next I did um, 
a project that was tracking the movement of neurites, which is a marine snail that you see in the pictures here on the right. And these were in intertidal zones. And my partner and I would visit different sites during low and high tide to do these measurements. However, if you know anything about tides, you know that they happen at all times of the day and night. So there were many times when my partner and I would be out at two, three o'clock in the morning with flashlights wading through really cold water to observe these neorites. And after that, I decided that um, I had no interest in work doing work that depended on tides, but I learned that I love doing research around coastal habitats. So my next project after that was during my senior year and I focused on red tide toxins. And red tides are another term for harmful algal blooms in the water. And these are often triggered by nutrient runoffs from areas on land like farms and golf courses. So during a bloom, the algae start to grow out of control, often turning the water red, like you see in this picture here. And at the same time, they're also releasing toxins that can have a negative effect on fish, mammals, birds, and even humans. So for this project, I looked at the impacts of the algae Carina brevis on fish. And at that time, that algae was known to impact fish breathing. So we experimented to learn what was the level that the toxin needed to be at for a fish to stop breathing, and if there was a way to support the fish in its breathing to help keep it alive. So I did this by exposing the goldfish to the toxins and seeing how quickly they would react, but then how quickly they recovered. And I would have to videotape them and time um, how long it took them to have a reaction. And you could see them swimming crazy all around and how long, how long it took them to return back to normal. And I also had to build a little contraption to get oxygen, to aerate their little gills with, with oxygen. Um, and then I would see if they had faster recovery times than those goldfish that didn't get the oxygen. And in fact, they did. But after this project, um, I realized that I really liked learning about fish. And I especially liked learning about how their habitats can be impacted by different factors but I didn't like having to mix up toxins and watching what happened when the fish got around them. So the toxicology part of it was not for me, but learning about impacts on coastal habitats, I was learning was kind of where I saw myself um, working. So my first official job out of college, I became a research assistant and studied coral reef habitats. Um, the folks in my lab would go out and do transects of reefs all around South Florida and the Caribbean. And that means they would take a very long measuring tape, place it on the reef and use that to measure how large it was. And they would dive or swim over it and take video or photos. Um, those files would come back to me and they would look like the quadrat um, on the left. And then my job was to identify all of the things inside of the squares, such as hard and soft corals, algae, seagrass, fish, invertebrates like crabs and other organisms. So depending on what was being studied or what the research question was, that could mean that I would have to identify every single thing that I saw, which could take a very long time. Or sometimes I would place random dots on the picture and just identify anything underneath those dots and use those to make an estimate of the population numbers. I really enjoyed this job so much because one, I got to learn um, the names of all of these different organisms, but I also learned a lot about corals and all the different animals and plants that help to create a coral reef ecosystem. And I realized that seafood that I and others like to eat live on or near reefs and others closely and other habitats closely related to reefs like seagrass and mangroves and that maintaining those fisheries meant really understanding and caring for these habitats. So um, around this time, um, I, got, I had an interesting offer and I got offered a part-time summer job teaching high school students about marine science. Now, I had never considered working in education before. It totally was not on my radar because I knew I wanted to be 
a scientist and doing science equaled being a scientist. Um, so I had never thought of it, but they were looking for someone who had a wide range of marine knowledge and experience, which I did. But most importantly, they were looking for someone who looked like their students and came from a similar background as their students who could also serve as mentors to inspire them into going into marine science for college. Many of these students were black or from the Latinx community. Um, many were from low income communities and they were also first generation college bound, which meant that if they did go to college, they would be the first in their families to do so. So mentors who looked like me, who could connect with them because I understood their backgrounds um, and I had similar experiences to the ones that they had. Um, it was really important um, because I would be able to impact them in a way that someone who couldn't connect with them could. And I did this six week program um, that summer and it really changed my life because I saw that being a scientist didn't mean just doing research. I could still be a scientist and call myself a science, a scientist, but also engage in informal science education and work with people to teach them about science. And that was just as valid. Um, and it was really important for me to get that experience to, to learn that. So later on that year, they reached out to me again and I was hired on full time to manage youth programs at the Miami Science Museum. And I worked there for about 10 years, maybe a little bit more, uh, as well as some other places like nature centers, aquariums, and other nonprofit organizations, initially doing work with teens to get them into college for a science field, but eventually transitioning to developing and running all kinds of programs like summer camps, creating demos, writing science curriculum, training staff and teachers, working closely with scientists and also doing outreach work in different communities to bring cool science to them. I also did some really interesting things like help to build exhibits. Um, and I even helped to design a brand new science museum. So if any of you are in Miami and you've been to the Frost um, Museum of Science, um, the aquarium building, I was part of the team that helped put that building together. Oh, that's amazing. I live in Miami, so I haven't been to the Frost Museum yet, which is, uh, I have to go. I've been just in like Boston recently, so I haven't had a chance, but it's amazing. And I see pictures of it and it's astonishing. Definitely so, check out the aquarium. Oh yeah, for sure. Especially since I'm considering marine science also as my major. I'm really looking forward to it. So also I want to thank you so much for sharing your story. And so now let's check back with our participants to see if they have any questions for Clarissa today. Casey, uh, what questions do we have coming in from the chat? All right, we have a lot of questions coming in. A uh, lot of viewers on YouTube, a lot of folks in the Zoom. So the first question comes from Ireland. She's tuning in from our Zoom. Have you ever been to Alaska? Have you worked in Alaska? And the question, they're in Chicago right now, but um, they're, they're curious if you've ever been to Alaska. <laughs> oh, I have been to Alaska. And actually um, one of the pictures on my very first slide um, was, me, was um, people in a training that I was leading in Alaska. I've been to Juneau and also a very tiny community called Huna. Um, and while I was in Huna, I was working with, um, folks from the Huna Indian Association to train them in science communication. It's the picture on the far right. Um, train them in science communication techniques so they can talk about the natural resources in their community to tourists and visitors who come to visit them. Awesome, great. Now we have a lot of questions coming in from YouTube, so bear with me. So um, here's, here's a pretty easy one that might be short and sweet. How long have you been a marine scientist? Oh man, I have to do some quick math. Um, I think it's been about 17 years. Excellent. 16 years, yeah. All right, and then another question, Julie from YouTube wants to know, uh, is there any way you can sum up what your day to day is like? Yeah, that's easy right now. Um, 
Um, because I am starting from the beginning with the program that I'm working on, my day-to-day -day is um, really trying to make connections within the community. So that involves everything from sending emails, reaching out to them via phone or video. Um, before we were locked in, um, going to where they work and seeing what they do and having conversations with them. Um, in the past, when I've done work at museums um, and some of the other places that I've worked at, my day-to-day -day would involve, um, one, lots of meetings, but also things like going out and checking exhibits and talking to people who come to um, the museums or nature centers or aquariums and having fun conversations with them, teaching them about science. But really my favorite thing was when I took breaks, my breaks would be going out and playing with stuff. Um, and I'm sad that I don't have that option anymore, but like I said, I love what I'm currently doing. Awesome. Um, can you explain why it is so important for local Bahamians to do research on their own island? That came from Jenna on YouTube. Yeah, that's a really great question. So a lot of the folks, um, including myself, who do much of the marine research here are not from here. Um, and I think it's really important that we help build local capacity because the changes that are happening in the ecosystem and the environment are happening here and they are the ones who are impacted by it. So it's really important that um, the community is aware of what's going on and really that community trust is built by having your own people involved in a lot of the work that's happening. Excellent. And Max wants to know how long you went to college to get your PhD. So we're asking you to do a little quick math again. Um, my PhD took six years, um, but since it was a continuation of my master's project, um, I just wrap them all up together in a total of eight years. Perfect. And um, let's see, how did you decide that studying oyster larvae wasn't for you? And maybe also to go along with this one is what piece of technology did you use to see small organisms like the larvae as well as the red tide organism? Um, so for the oyster larvae, um, I was just using a very high powered microscope and that really was the deciding factor. I decided I did not like looking at little things through microscopes all day. That was definitely not for me. Um, and with the red tide toxins, I wasn't so much looking at the organism, um, but using the, the toxin that they generated. So we were actually able to get um, the toxin from a lab. So I didn't really have to like find the organism and search for it to get the toxin. And to go along with that, Teresa on YouTube wants to know where are these organisms located in the world? And I do assume that she is asking about red tide. So the red tide toxin that I, um, that I studied is based primarily um, in the Gulf of Mexico off of um, Florida coast, the west coast of Florida. Excellent. And we have two questions coming in from YouTube that kind of revolve around volunteering. So Kira asks, when you were getting into your career or in your current job, did you do any volunteer work? And then to follow that up, Ash asks, are there any volunteer opportunities you would recommend for high school students? I did do volunteer work. Um, I volunteered um, a lot with my college. So whenever they needed assistance with um, some of the lower level classes, I would volunteer to do that. I also volunteered at Biscayne National Park, helping out with their coral nursery program. Um, and helping to gather and train other volunteers to help do the monitoring for that. Um, for um, teens, I would say there are lots of opportunities to volunteer. Check out, depending on what you're interested in, um, check out your local parks, um, your local museums or aquariums. Um, sometimes there are even opportunities to, if you like working with kids, to volunteer, um, like maybe with some elementary schools and working with younger kids as well. Um, but see what's available in your area and based on what your interests are um, and definitely get out there and volunteer because it's a great way to gain some experience. That's great. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. So everybody out there, hang tight. 
keep them coming because we will have another question break. But before we continue, Maria, I do want to ask Dr. Kawa, because this is a pretty good one. What are some of the things that an engineer might have to think of when building an aquarium, since you mentioned that you help to design the frost aquarium? Uh, that's a really great question. Um, and I wish I was part of the team that actually designed the aquarium portion because it is so cool. Um, but, and I go like this because the aquarium in the Frost Museum is actually kind of shaped like, um, like a cone, like a martini glass. And there were all of these really cool engineering that had to happen because they had to figure out how to be able to do that and keep this really cool view window at the bottom um, and how to pour concrete around that so that you could maintain the shape. And um, one of the things they figured out that they needed to do was they needed to do a continuous concrete pour for about, um, for over 24 hours so that no part of it would, would harden before they got the correct shape. So engineers have really hard jobs. <laughs> Okay, so those are very good, very, um, those are great questions and we will come back for more. So keep typing in those questions in the chat spaces. So Dr. Colwood, how did you get back into research? So even though I love doing um, education, informal science education, I knew ultimately that I wanted to do research. Um, and the, the more I got involved in um, the informal science education work and the higher up I moved into different positions, the further I was kind of pulled away from that research. So given that all of the things that I had done and I experienced, I knew I wanted to do fisheries work in coastal habitats, but I also wanted to explore how people in fisheries engage with science. And that was something that I pulled from the informal science world. So this is where my work shifted to looking at Caribbean spiny lobster fisheries. So around the time I started grad school, the lobster fishery in the Bahamas was entering a process to certify that their fishery was sustainable. And one of the biggest questions about keeping that sustainability was around the use of structures called condos. These condos, which many people called casitas, are one way that fishers in the Bahamas use to catch lobster. And you can see here that um, there are many different ways to make these condos. Um, they're different from traps because they don't have a door on them and they have no bottom. So the lobster can easily come and go as they please. But at the same time, they really do provide a perfect habitat for lobster because lobsters love really dark spaces and they also love to be around lots of other lobsters. Having a condo meant that a fisher no longer had to hunt for lobsters on the reef because before they would dive around and look in these little dark holes on the reef and kind of use a tickle stick to get these lobsters out. But now um, they could either put down a condo or if they know where a condo is located, they can swim or boat to it, dive down, and collect all the lobster from underneath, where there could be anywhere from 20 up to 200 lobsters at one time. So why, why is this a problem? Well, if you take a look at this picture from a Fisher's GPS unit, each of these flags represent a condo that this person fishes from when lobster season is open. And when we take a close-up of this, um, we can see that there are so many condos in this little area. And in fact, there are about a thousand condos in this picture. What's even more concerning is that none of these condos are owned by the person who showed me these pictures, um, which is a really big challenge with using condos. The people who build them and put them out are often not the only people fishing from them. And that can cause a lot of issues like fighting and potentially even overfishing because you don't know how many were there before you got to it. So a big part of my project was trying to get a better handle on how many condos were set up throughout the entire Bahamas, where they were putting these condos, who's putting them out there, and who is fishing from them. I also looked at how the lobster ended up where they were. 
especially because the Bahamas has a thriving, successful fishery. And when you look at um, the other um, spiny lobster fisheries throughout the Caribbean, many of them aren't doing that well um, and certainly aren't doing as well as the one in the Bahamas. Um, so what I did was I used computer modeling to track the lobster larvae as they moved around from areas where they were born, their nursery habitats, to the areas where they finally ended up, their settlement habitats. Um, and here, these pictures show lobster at different stages because they can move at all of these stages. In the upper left corner, um, this is when a lobster is only about a couple of days old and it begins to float around in the ocean with other plankton. And in the picture right next to it, this is when it's about five to six months old. And you can see in that next picture, they're only about the size of your, the tip of your finger. Um, and this is when they start to settle or find their habitats, right? And this is where um, they decide where they're going to live and become adults. Um, the bottom picture is when they are juveniles. And the last picture shows what the lobsters look like when you buy them from a fisherman. So what's really cool about lobster as larvae is that they'll spend a lot of time swimming around. Um, and then when they find the right spot, they'll drop out and settle in a seagrass area. But if they don't find the right spot, they continue to travel for sometimes up to a year. Um, and why that's important is because um, a lobster could be spawned or born anywhere else in the Caribbean and could potentially end up in the Bahamas. And that's actually what I saw with my research. Um, the model that I used predicted that lobster larvae, larvae spawn, spawned or born in the Bahamas, um, for the most part, often stayed within Bahamian waters. Um, but about 50% of the larvae that was spawned elsewhere, that was spawned throughout the Caribbean, actually settled in the Bahamas too. So that meant that a lobster that was potentially spawned in the Virgin Islands where I'm from, or in Mexico, or even as far south as Brazil, could potentially end up living in Bahamian waters and getting caught by a Bahamian fisher. So what that means for management, that if you want to protect your fisheries stock, um, that you might need to work with other countries to make sure that where the lobsters are coming from is also being protected, not just the areas where they're, being, where they're ending up. I also spent a lot of time observing and talking to fishers to learn about their process, how they were building condos, what materials they use, and to discuss the conflicts that they were having with each other since they started to use condos. Um, I also wanted to know any changes they've seen in the fishery or the ecosystem over time, especially since they spend almost every day in and on the water. Um, we also talked to them about things like what they thought about the laws and regulations. Did they think they were fair? And what regulations would they like to see? Overall, the fishers really liked using condos because it helped make fishing easier, but they didn't like that they got into so many more fights with other fishers because of them. And many of the fishers wanted to see stricter regulations, which was surprising um, because over time, they've seen the lobster decrease, um, especially those fishers who've been doing it for 30 or 40 years but they also want to see more enforcement from the government for those fishers who do break the law and break some of those regulations. Well, Dr. Kovac, you've done a lot of pretty amazing work. And out of everything you've done, what was the coolest thing you've ever experienced? Um, so one of the coolest things I've experienced was when I lived in Washington in a little town called Port Townsend. Um, and the Marine Science Center that I was working at um, got offered um, a gray whale. Um, and the reason we were offered a whale was that there was a young gray whale that was dying in the waters. Um, and they wanted to um, do a necropsy on it to find out why it died. But once they did that, they didn't have anything to do with the body. Um, so this was a great opportunity for a science center like ours to be able to get the bones of a gray whale skeleton to use for educational purposes. Um, so I did something called flensing. 
Um, and in order to get at the bones, um, you have to remove everything else. Um, and this is like the really gross part. So this is a 30 foot whale, um, about 30,000 pounds. Um, and if you look in that picture in the upper left hand corner, way in the back, you'll see um, that dark thing way in the back. That's actually what's left of the whale. Um, and in that picture, I'm carrying the whale baleen, which is their teeth that they used to filter out um, their food. So we made essentially a whale burrito. That is what we called it um, by cutting off, again, this is the gross part, by cutting off all of the fat and the meat and the blubber um, and getting rid of it so that we could get um, the body to a place where it could decompose. And then we drug the whale burrito back into the oceans where the crabs and the fish and the other critters could do the hard work of getting all of the, um, all of the flesh off. Um, so what, ended up, what we ended up with in the, um, on the next slide is all of the bones. So in the, the top picture, um, these are the bones right after they were pulled out of the water. Um, and we had to find a place for them to completely dry out. Um, and someone in, in the town offered us their greenhouse to put them in. So they were there for about a year. And after that, we cleaned them up and we had a fully articulated gray whale skeleton. Um, and working with marine mammals was something that I've never been interested in and something that you know I never thought I would do. So this was something that was so cool, um, really hands-on, really gross and messy. As you can see from the pictures, um, I was covered in gunk. Um, but it's something that I will never have the opportunity to do again. Um, I don't want to do it again, but it was cool to have the opportunity to do it. That's so cool. I love marine animals. I'm like marine animals and I find it fascinating. So now, um, Dr. Code, could we talk about like realities, uh, some realities, for instance, uh, how much can someone expect to make if they follow your footsteps? So that really depends on um, what your experience level is. Sometimes it depends on the degree that you have, but not always. Um, and a lot of times it depends on um, where you live. So I actually worked in two different fields. I've worked in science fields and I've worked in informal science education um, and it really varies. So as a marine scientist, depending on what level you're at, you can make anywhere from 40K to 90K. Um, and for science museums, it's a very similar range, but it also depends on the job it is that you're doing. Um, so when I left um, my last science museum job, I was a vice president. So I was making more towards that top level, um, but ultimately all of these jobs are in nonprofit. And if you're working in nonprofit, you can't, you're not gonna be a millionaire, um, but you can, you can work in a place um, and work for an organization that will pay you decently um, so that you can live comfortably. Um, one of the things, uh, like I said earlier, depending on the place that you live, um, the pay might change. So when I moved from Miami to a very itty bitty tiny town um, and I was doing basically the same type of job, I did get paid a little bit less because it was a small town and they didn't um, earn the same amount of money that a big place like Miami could make. So a lot of different factors go into that. That's nice. I have a question for you though. So because I'm looking forward to majoring in marine science, is there possible that I can have a job after completing my bachelor's in marine science? Yeah, there are tons of marine scientists who work with a bachelor's degree. You definitely do not need um, a master's or a PhD, and that depends on the type of work that you're doing. Um, a lot of times people who have PhDs, they get them because you need that in order to be a professor um, and in order to work at, some, um, at a certain level in the university field, but you definitely don't need it in order to do marine science research. Excellent. So for here at Earth Echo, we believe that we can act now for a sustainable future. So can you tell us how does your work contribute to a sustainable future? 
Yeah, so much of the work at Perry Institute focuses on preserving corals and related organisms that depend on reef habitats for survival and vice versa. The research we do helps us to understand the changes that we see happening and the work we do in communities helps us to understand the role that people play in contributing to those changes. We've seen that play out quite recently with um, the recent appearance of stony coral tissue loss disease, which was just discovered on the reefs in the Bahamas in January and is most likely spread by ballast water from boats or maybe even from divers and snorkelers. No one is really sure yet because the disease is so new. So there's lots of current research being done on that disease right now. But we're also looking at the impacts caused by different fisheries and the different stakeholders and how they are driving some of those changes. Um, the pictures that you see here are of parrotfish, um, which are starting to be caught more in the Bahamas for people to eat, which is a relatively new thing. And we refer to that as an emerging fishery. The problem with this is that parrotfish are really important to the health of corals because they eat the algae off the corals and prevent the algae from smothering the reef. So the less parrotfish there are, the more algae there is covering the reef, and that increases the chancing of the coral and maybe even that reef dying. So research on the parrotfish population, but also why and how people fish for parrotfish is important for understanding how to keep the reef healthy and around for future generations. And a large part of my job <clears throat> is to help determine what actions people can take to contribute to helping us keep these ecosystems healthy. Our work tries to highlight that conservation and ultimately sustainability can't be achieved unless local communities are involved. And they have to understand why conservation is important globally, but really we want people to understand why it's important to them personally, because it's only when they understand that that they will want to make changes to help the environment. And many researchers, including us at Perry, are doing incredible work, but it doesn't matter if that research doesn't actually get to the people. And that involves making connections, building trust with them so that they know who we are, what we're doing and why, and that it will also benefit them too. It involves creating opportunities for communities to learn and engage together. Um, but most importantly, it inspires them um, involves inspiring them to take actions that make sense for them, but also transforming them into advocates for the environment. And this is really a big part of what I'll be focusing on um, as I work on the project that I'm currently working on now. Thank you so much, Dr. Colwood. So I have another question that just came to me. So mm -hmm. in your undergrad career, how was your day-to-day -day life being a major, having a major in marine science? How, how what did your day consist of? <laughs> My day consisted of a lot of classes. So at the University of Miami, back when I was in the marine science program, you couldn't be a marine biology major. You had to major in marine science, and you also had to major in um, another science like biology, chemistry, physics, geology. Um, so essentially, we were doing two degrees at the same time. Um, so what that meant was that every semester, I was taking seven to eight classes, seven of which were a science class. So I would take a marine science, a biology, a chemistry, a physics, a calculus. Um, and then if I was lucky, I would have an English class or an art class. Um, but really, uh, my day to day was going from dif to different science classes going to different labs, going out into the field and actually experiencing and seeing the things that we were learning about. Um, and it was pretty tough. And I hated having all of those classes, but now I really appreciate it because it gave me such um, a wide depth in sciences and a wide grounding um, that um, it makes doing my job as an interdisciplinary scientist much easier because I have a great background in all of the sciences. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Colwood. So as we wrap up, do you have any words of advice for students out there? Maybe something you wish you had known back in high school? 
Um, so my words of advice um, actually come from Miss Frizzle from my favorite TV show, The Magic School Bus. And that's take chances, make mistakes, get messy. Um, as you can see from my talk, um, I did lots of different things, many of which um, did not work out for me because I realized this is not what I want to do. Um, this was not fun for me. Um, but doing those things was important because it really helped me figure out what I didn't like, but really what I did like and ultimately where my passion was. So it's really important um, for you to get out there and try different things. Um, and that's definitely something that um, I didn't know in high school. Like I said, I knew I wanted to be a scientist and I knew I wanted to work in the ocean. So that meant marine scientist. Um, and I didn't know that there were all of these different things out there. So really getting that experience was important. Um, and it's important to just get out and do as much as you can to learn what it is you wanna do. And also have fun while you're doing it. Yeah, that's the most important thing, having fun. And especially you, since you said you, you live your dream job. So that's, that's, something what I, that's something that I want to. So this has been so great. So now let's check back for some last questions from our viewing audience. Casey, what questions do we have coming in from the chat? All right, we have a lot of questions out there. So uh, this comes from actually several people watching. What is the strangest thing you have ever seen in the ocean? Um, I don't know what the strangest thing is. I'd say um, I've seen um, a newly born lionfish uh, when I was diving once and it was like this big. And it was, it looked like a full grown adult, but it was like super itty bitty tiny. Um, and that was pretty cool. That's awesome. Um, so Autumn wants to know if you have ever eaten lobster. I have, I love lobster. And when I was a kid, um, that was one of the things that my dad would fish for, for me all the time. So whenever, if he only caught one lobster, everybody knew that was Carlisa's lobster. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And Ireland wants to know, if you didn't choose the job you have now, what would you do instead? Um, I think if I didn't have the job I have now, um, that I would probably still be working in science museums. Um, I really do love working in spaces like that because I not only get to do marine science, but I get to do lots of other sciences as well. And it also gives me the opportunity to work with lots of different people, um, not just the people like who are my colleagues, but the visitors that we see every day and also the communities that we get the chance to work with. Excellent. Um, so Kira asked, this is a really good question. After um, Hurricane Dorian, what sorts of effects did you see? Um, you know, how did that impact your home or your work? Um, so Hur Hurricane Dorian hit the Northern Islands in the Bahamas. Um, so it didn't really impact Nassau per se, which is where I live now. Um, but one of the things that Perry Institute has been doing is they immediately went out after Dorian and did reef surveys um, to look at some of the damage that happened to the coral reefs. Um, and there was quite a bit of damage. Um, some coral heads got moved really far distances or became overturned, um, which was due to the really strong winds generating um, even stronger currents in the water. So there was a lot of damage that they did see um, in the marine environment around the islands that were in the eye of the storm. Okay, and that brings another good question. Somebody had asked, can you explain, um, I know you talked a little bit about Perry Institute, but where are their headquarters? Because I know scientists, there's a lot of scientists with Perry that work in lots of different places. Yeah, the Perry Institute, it's actually headquartered in um, Vermont, New Hampshire. I'm new, so <laughs> it's one of the little states up at the top. I do believe it's Vermont. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, well, just me. So many of us actually um, work remotely and we travel when we have to do our research. That's wonderful. And um, let's see, how rare is a blue lobster? 
Um, it depends in the, on the area that you're in. So some um, ecosystems have lots of blue lobsters. I think they're more common in Pacific ecosystems. Um, so it really depends on the location that you're in. Excellent. And I think uh, we'll take this one last question to wrap things up. Um, do you have any recommendations, recommendations for colleges for students who want to go into marine biology? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I will always be a cane, uh, go University of Miami, um, and I will always recommend it because I got a fantastic education for both undergrad um, and grad school, but it is a private school and it costs a lot of money. So um, I was lucky enough to be funded for my entire school career. Um, I got scholarships and um, fellowships, um, but you don't need to go to um, a big school or a popular school like the University of Miami. There are lots of schools that do um, marine science degrees. Um, and what's really important is finding a school that works for you. Um, maybe that is a small local school, maybe it's a bigger state school, but really do your research. Um, and what's most important is just making sure that it had that they're going to cover the things that you want to learn. Thank you so much, Dr. Callwood, for being with us today. And everyone out there can follow Dr. Callwood's work in Perry Institute for Marine Science on social media. Dr. Callwood was generous enough to also put her email for any further questions. So thank you again and so much. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your journey with us and with STEM Explore. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure knowing more about you and your experience in your field. And again, we want to thank our founding sponsor, Raytheon Technologies, for their support of women in STEM. And lastly, stay tuned to earthecho.org to find out more information about all of our exciting programs, including upcoming virtual events just like this one. And be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo on all our social media channels. And also additionally, on behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you guys for joining us and keep exploring.